I've been a horror movie fan for many of my formative years, from drive-in movies to double feature chiller. And though many think most horror fans are white adolescent males, I was a fan too, a black girl. And in 80s horror, the heroes were girls, white girls. Film theorists called them final girls. These women fought and survived to the end of the movie and outsmarted the killer. This was awesome, but I'd been so programmed I hadn't noticed what was missing, the black girl. So I set out to find them and figure out, were there black women in horror? This is my final girl. Brooklyn, and you're watching My Final Girl, the show that unearths all the truths about black women and American horror cinema. Uh, today's a Halloween edition, so I have a co-host, Hedda Jones. Hey, Hedda. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, today's a hol uh, Halloween edition. It's about a week before, a little over a week before Halloween, and so that's why this is happening like that. Okay, so today's chomp of the day. Dun, dun, dun. Circus peanuts, chomp of the day. Um, when I was a kid, circus peanuts were yummy little marshmallows, slightly stale goodies. Today they are made out of sugar, corn syrup, gelatin, pectin, artificial flavor, color, blah, blah. Probably wasn't healthy back then either, but um, it's cool to see they're still are around. That and maybe candy corn um, were kind of like those kind of side, side sweet treats that were totally unhealthy for you, but you liked them anyway. So yeah, that's the chomp of the day, um, Circus Peanuts. And today's slurp of the day is Zombie Survival Can. Um, my hubby got this for me, and I think it's dang hilarious. In case of zombie apocalypse, drink entire can contents to ensure speedy escape. Fill can with rocks, then throw at a zombie. Hmm... Uh, substitute for gas mask in case of toxic cloud. Um, okay. Um, use can to collect rainwater. Boil if necessary. Hmm. You would still have to put some kind of cool funnel on it, but I bet yeah, that could work. Okay. Um, dispose of can properly. Sound of litter can alert zombies to your presence. Hey, even a zombie, even in a zombie uh, apocalypse, leave no trace. So that's today's <laughs> of the day. Uh, today's shout outs uh, go to some wonderful women in horror. About two horror. About two weeks ago, uh, Hannah Foreman, uh, founder of Women in Horror Month, did her inaugural film inaugural film festival called Axe Wound. I, f I feel like there should be a really, really dirty promo for that it's like do 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 <laughs> uh, I, my mind is somewhere so bad um axe wound film festival 36 short horror films directed by women woohoo in brattlesboro vermont this happened october 10th and it was a plethora of really awesome horror done by some really awesome chicks so and i was invited down there to speak on um, Black Women in Horror. Uh, I'm actually going to show you. Hello. 
my final girl, the black women of 70s horror. And it was moderated by my friend, Ashley Blackwell. And she has Graveyard Shift Sisters. Um, we'll throw a graphic up. Uh, Graveyard Shift Sister, we just totally are going to make the best and largest database of black women in horror ever, ever. And you're going to be like, yay, Ashley, yay, Christina. So, yeah, she moderated uh, a discussion on black women in horror uh, with me. And that was a lot of fun. But some other great women that I met there include Lynn Hansen, who's short film Chomp is doing, as you see all those laurels, uh, is doing the circuit right now, the festival circuit. Uh, Small Talk by Nicole Solomon. If you are in the New York City area, uh, Small Talk is going to be showing at the Big Apple Film Festival November 6th, so check that out. Izzy Lee's Postpartum. Any of you moms out there, it was super creepy. This is a great little short um, and a great gal. And, oh, whoa, what's that? My Finer Girl, I think it's a documentary about black women in horror. Ah. Um, so, yeah, that was great. So shout out to all of them. And a special shout out for a feature film, The Ladies of the House, writer Justina Walford. Uh, she's doing festival runs with that. She's all over the place with that. But now it's on Hulu. So if you want a little uh, hot, sexy carnality, cannibalism, lesbianism, blood, gore, with beautiful color tones and a most artsy amazing you don't know if you want to come or vomit did i just say that oh my god i'm sorry um then see the ladies of the house on hulu now writer justina walford uh that was a hell of a plug uh yeah really um what the what so here's my thing this segment is where i just kind of like call out something like huh or maybe I'm I'm doing sleuth work. This year, I'm calling out New York Comic Con. That was last week, October 8th through 11th. Same weekend, I was really busy. I went from uh, Axe Wound to Comic Con to Axe Wound. But Axe Wound was just as important to comic as Comic Con to me. So here's my sleuth, my really, um, what the what? Uh, 2012, I went to Comic Con on a Friday. I had a Friday past New York Comic Con. And Andrea from The Walking Dead was on my pass. And then, in that season, she died. And so this year, I'm wondering, Abraham is on my Friday pass. So let's just, let's just see. If he dies this season, then you know it's, it's really dangerous to be on a Friday pass at Comic-Con. So that's my really, uh, what the what? I hope you live, Abraham, but we don't know. So now for the meat of things. And to take a more serious tone, my horror pairing of the show is the... Uh, the kitten caboodle. Um, horror pairing for today is Ganja and Hess. Ganja and Hess came out in 1973. It's 112 minutes. Written and directed by Bill Gunn, starring Marlene Clark, Dwayne Jones, Sam Wayman, Mabel King. Director of photography, James Hinton. Produced by Chiz Schultz. 35 millimeter re- re-release. Um, that is being paired today with Horror Noir. Came out all uh, 2011, Rutledge Press. Writer is Dr. Robin Means Coleman. And there's a second, this time, a second pairing. Monstrous Feminine Film, Feminism, psychoanalyst, uh, psycho- Psychoanalysis. <laughs> so let's just say that again. The Monstrous Feminine Film, Feminism, Psychoanalysis by uh, Barbara Creed. A great book, too. So why, you ask, am I pairing these two, Horror Noir, Monstrous Feminine, and the, the full title, sorry, Horror Noir, Blacks in, a, in American Horror Films from the 1890s to the Present. So why am I pairing uh, Horror Noir and the Monstrous Feminine with Ganja and Hess, you ask? Yes, I'm doing that. I'm glad you asked, Hatta. I'm doing that because um, I want to look at two at two really great aspects of this film. One of which is the black or black horror versus blacks in horror uh, aspect, and why this is, in my mind, a black horror film. And also, I want to look at the dangerous sexuality of women, um, or the monstrous sexuality in women and the fear of vampires breaking the rules um so that that's why monstrous feminine is totally makes sense um we'll have a couple of interviews which will 
uh, I'll show you guys. I say I'm um, a lot. I'm sorry. Um, so let's get to it. Ganjin Hess, Dr. Hess Green, is an archaeologist that goes to Africa and gets stabbed by the knife or the the blade of Murthia, or by the Queen of Murthia with a blade, and then he comes back home from his expedition and he has an addiction to blood. It's kind of part of the preamble to it because he comes back and he's mysterious and he's well spoken, well read. He's you know his assistant George Maida, who's played by Bill Gunn, the writer director, has his own demons, and as they have these deep um, philosophical discussions at Hess's home, you see that he's troubled, Maida is troubled, and he winds up committing suicide uh, in Dr. Hess Green's home. Hess hides the body, and George Maida's wife, Ganja, comes looking for George and is determined to stay right there in Dr. Hess Green's house until his hus- her husband comes back. She finds out he's dead. Somehow the two of them, being on a, uh, a simpatico level of understanding, fall in love he takes her over to the addiction side by making her a bloodluster as well. Um, then has a, uh, oh, I'm doing total spoiler. He has a uh, questioning of his faith. He wants her to go with him and find redemption in God, but she's quite happy in the world of vampirism. And then the end happens. I won't spoil that, but that's enough of a plot to tell you what Ganjan Hess is about. It's a stunning movie. And what's interesting to know, and we'll get into, is uh, Monstrous Feminine talks a lot about the the vampire and uh, abjection. And it leads back to the the idea of the abject from a variety of of theorists, but specifically I like uh, Julia Kristeva's Powers of Horror, and she talks about abject, mostly in the the concepts of the female body and just us being abject. We, We have cycles, menstrual cycles, we shit, we all of our excrement and how that along with, you know, she, she dissects Freud and Lacan, but how that along with the absence of a penis, but the ability to, to create life, it makes us this feared entity, um, to others, others being men. Uh, and I like that within the monstrous feminine, Barbara Creed talks about the, the abject in vampirism as being this, ability for vampires to female vampires to own their sexuality to not be identified i'm i love the, i'm just going to read the quote because i think it's stunning the female vampire is abject because she disrupts identity and order driven by her lust for blood she does not respect the dictates of law which sets down the rules of proper sexual conduct so she basically you're saying she's abject or yuck because she's sexual deviant, she's independent, she's what she wants to be sexually instead of any prescribed notion of what society tells her she has to be. She can hump a wall, she can hump a woman, she can hump a man, and that makes her a deviant, that makes her abject, that makes her scary. And I think that's, you know, again, I don't want to give the total spoiler of Ganja and Hesaway, but I think that's something to be revered within Ganja's uh, character. She makes decisions for herself. And she even has a great monologue about, you know, her relationship to her mother and when she decided to t- take control of her identity. And you you might still question, like, how she and Maida got together, but inevitably I feel like Ganja, Ganja Maida embodies the abject, the, the strength of objection within the woman. So um, here's a great clip from Ganja and Hess. <laughs>
so ex- ex- exactly that 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 kind of embodies kind of a woman coming into her own and um then looking at interestingly enough looking at the the blacks in horror i have two great things i want to piggyback i'm gonna do back to back um two excerpts here but blacks and horror versus black horror something interesting blacks and horror was any time let's put a black person in there and what do black people do boom that's blacks and horror versus black horror where you really get into the history the culture and the and the reality of 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 a of a group of people, which is very much what what um, Ganja and Hess did. It wasn't like the the black exploitation seventies movies. It 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 spoke the truth of black people, educated black people. I'm not to, not to say that there weren't educated people in black exploitation, but it didn't really go to the tropes or the stereotypes as much as it asserted deep mythology deep cultural reference, deep meaning. And it, it took, even on the very basic level of addiction, it took it to a deeper level. It wasn't just like a, you know, hitting your arm addiction. It was something that you you're, you spiritually were at, you spiritually at odds with, Hess, Hess was. He was emotionally at odds with this. Even in the scene when he he killed the, the, the hooker, you know, but he didn't kill the the baby, you know. That was that was his morality saying, you know, I don't feel comfortable. And when he went to the blood bank to get blood, that again morality had a play in it. So it it really showed it really showed a good side a side. So the two anyway, I don't want to get too deep. The two things I want to show you right now first um, is I'm going to do them back to back and then come back to it. the first is an interview with Dr. Robin Means Coleman explaining her concept. Uh, or what she tries to define in the book as a difference between, as I've just mentioned, but she'll go into better detail, black horror versus black blacks in horror. And then I'm following that up with a really, really interesting anecdote from the producer of Ganja and Hess, Chiz Schultz, talking about his experience with the Teamsters when they heard that there was um, uh, a feature film being made uh, in uh, upstairs, or up in near Nyack, Croton and Harbor, uh, Croton Harbor, New York. So, enjoy both of those clips. And yeah. what I was so in the book, I make a distinction between two different kinds of films that I'm looking at. There are these sort of mainstream films that have blacks in them. They may even be black stars. Uh, this may be a film like Candyman because people kind of that's a popular film. People know Candyman. And so we're going to bracket that. And then there are films that I write about that I talk call um, black horror films. Black A black horror film may be a film like Death by Temptation. What I try to do is say that black people appear in both, in starring roles, um, in, in supporting roles, in both of these sort of subgenres of the horror films. But if you look at them and sort of through a sort of cultural lens, they have very different messages, very different relationships to how they talk about um, the experiences within blackness. And this really tough guy came in, white guy, tough. He said, I hear you're doing a feature film. And I said, yeah, we are. And he said, uh, and I hear you haven't hired any Teamsters. And I said, uh, oh, well, of course, we're just low budget. We have no money at all. We're doing it for nothing. And he said, uh, yeah, but you're, uh, you have actors, actors. You're running equipment. You're, you have money. And you don't have any teamsters. And I said, well, we, we couldn't afford them. It's just, it's impossible. And he said, I also hear the mansion you're shooting in is highly flammable. It's all wood. And I said, yeah. Yeah, it's a wooden mansion. He said, it'd be a pity if anything happened to that before the shoot started, wouldn't it? And I said, look, all I'm telling you is we're low budget. The whole staff, crew, and cast is predominantly black. He said, what? I said, it's an all black feature film. He said, niggers. He said, I'm out of here. Go do your fucking film. Personally, when I was sitting there listening to him say that, 
part of me was shocked and part of me really wasn't because it, you know and that's the problem with horror you know not enough people invest in, in multicultural horror and if there is a, a black an asian a latino they're dumped into that role there are not enough ganja and hesses uh made with true genuine stories built on true cultural constructs of what certain minority groups are you know i'm not gonna sit here and make um a black movie with uh, a black horror movie and, and make sure there's chicken on the set just because that's what you know, <laughs> that's a stupid trope that some stupid idiot thought and i like chicken don't get me wrong but it's like, do we? Can't we refrain from that? Can't we go a bit deeper? Um, so also, I want to actually show you this great clip, and this is this is something too that kind of lends itself to both the horror, um, monstrous feminine, and just the power of women in cinema, and to to horror noir. And it's Sam Wayman, who is was a composer, um, also Nina Simone's brother, and he played the chauffeur slash pastor in the film, and he speaks to just how Bill Gunn treated Marlene in the film and, and why that was special. So have a look. Some of the black women that I was very friendly with and very close to spoke highly of the fact that they were inspired by Marlene Clark's performance in Gunn's and Hess and how, she, how Bill Gunn made her look so beautiful. You know, one of the things that he, he was extremely adamant about, and we, we would fight with lighting people about this, not every black actor can be lit by the same light that you light a white actor. It's two different kinds of hues. Ah, uh, yeah, I need to say no more. I'm, yeah, I'm going to run out of time, but I want to just... Throw to you one more clip, and this is from Marlene Clark about her experience with Ganja and Hess. I don't think the studio thought they were going to get the movie that they got. I don't know what Bill told them or presented them with. I, I have no idea. But they wouldn't have signed off on what they got because they didn't like what they got. They got this very esoteric, very avant-garde situation where, you know, um, the, 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 the vampirism sta stands for something. It's just not people going around doing that. There's, there's something that it stands for, uh, which is addiction. They weren't interested in any of that. So that, that's all the time I have. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you go. If you have not seen Ganja and Hess starring Marlene Clark and Dwayne Jones, see it. Uh, rent it on Netflix. Buy it. It's, it's been remastered by MoMA, the Kino Classics. It's, it's to its original form, and it's amazing. So do that. If you haven't read it, and if you really want to get to the heart and, and had just have a different... I feel like it'll just give you a different perspective on the female, the female, the female body, women in horror. Please, uh, and you don't have to be a film person to read it. Just get it because it's good. Um, the Monstrous Feminine uh, by Barbara Creed. And if you are just surprised that there's so much information about blacks in horror, by all means, 2011 horror noir she just she lays it out dr robin means Coleman. both of these women do a stunning job on both the black and the feminist aspect uh to horror horror films and uh the semiotics of horror and the cultural uh semiotics the cultural and the feminist feminist semiot semiotics of horror so um with that said uh thank you for watching my final girl i am klm Brooklyn on Twitter. There's My Final Girl on Facebook. If you want to see this episode, see more about black women in horror and my whole world of My Final Girl, please go to softdigitalnetwork.com. And yeah, till next time, peace is out. <laughs>
dilly bop, dilly bop. I just came back from around the block. I just came back from around the block. 